Hello everybody, uh, today I'm with Dr. Barbara Brockway, who's been a long time professional friend, fabulous cosmetic scientist. And today as part of um, really a celebration, our ongoing celebration about uh, STEM, Barbara's really going to take us through uh, her career and talk to us a little bit about um, cosmetic science. So welcome Barbara. Well, thank you for that great introduction, Pauline. It's a pleasure to be here. So, um, you're going to ask me, yeah? Tell us a little bit about your career. Okay, you're going to ask me about how I became a scientist. Well, I'm not one of the world's best students. I'm a secondary modern student, and uh, I left school without any qualifications. It was the BTEC system at college that saved me, and I cannot praise them too highly. It got me interested in general science, so I did a national diploma in science, and eventually I climbed up the ladder, uh, got a degree at uh, Kent University, and uh, stayed on to do a PhD at Kent University. So very proud of my PhD. That was in biochemistry. And then I went to Reading University and I lectured in the food science and technology department. And um, eventually I met Anita Roddick and she persuaded me to join her at the body shop. So that's my scientific background. I'm a biochemist who fell into the industry. And it's so good to be with you today, Pauline, because so many people in our industry have a similar story. They fell into the cosmetic industry. It'd be so much nicer if youngsters set out on their journey for a career in cosmetic science. You'd waste, you'd say, you'd get there far quicker. You wouldn't waste time on going in the wrong direction. So, um, this hopefully will inspire some people listening. You make me laugh actually, because when I think about how I fell into it, I ended up, I was in the brewing industry, so I used to make beer. And uh, then after that, I had a parachute accident. And then after that, I was sort of looking for a job and managed to uh, start working um, as a cosmetic scientist, really. So it's a funny, it is funny the way you wind your way, but also it's quite interesting how many, um, how many applications there are, for example, from the food industry and what we do and vice versa. And we're the hidden subject, aren't we? Because when you go to schools and universities, people do talk about food science, even talk about brewing science, especially with biotechnology at the moment, but you very rarely hear them talk about cosmetic science. And yet, as you say, it's the same science, it's the same applied chemistry that's behind our products as we see in the other industries. There is a difference though. We're very creative, so it's so important that you understand the senses. So the sense of touch, the sense of smell, that is an important part of making a good cosmetic. So we're looking for people who have both the creative artist side, as well as the interested and the um, detective science side as well. And what do you, what excites you most about being a scientist, Barbara? What's your, like... What well, you, you, know, you know me well. I love things that wow, I love gadgets, I love things that do the unexpected, something you touch that's cold but should be hot, um, things that foam and fizz and if you can make a bath bomb then why can't you make a torpedo? So I like to take an idea and say can we take that one step beyond and as you know sometimes I go two steps beyond and have to be reined back in but <laughs> so I, I like uh, doing the unexpected and uh, making things for the first time. Just, just the wham people. I have to say that you've been one of my great inspirations when every time you've visited, you'd come along with something that's inspired something. So I, you know, you, you brought along the, the color changing beads, which inspired our KL3D, which is like, you know, almost 10 years ago now. So it's always, I, I really, really appreciate the uh, excitement and the vision. And as you say, I think that our industry is all about a combination of almost the arts and the science in terms of how your brain works and sort of can you imagine something that hasn't been created before and how do you create it, for example. It's really uh, very exciting. And also, you know, for us particularly here at Nourish London, we're always sort of trying to make things more organic or more, we'll make things vegan. We have a, so it's, a, it's, it's interesting when you push yourself what you can actually achieve. Um, and certainly I can remember when I first started in the industry, you know, no one had heard of organic, but now, you know, yeah. there's, there's plenty of organic raw materials, for example. I mean, do you have a view on some of that? Uh, I mean, aren't we lucky? Because um, I remember I worked with Anita Roddick 
body shop and we were talking about circular economies long before the industry even thought about it so to be there not just at the beginning but we were before the beginning and to see that i mean it's sad that climate change has forced the world to now think more about the materials they use but to think that we were there at, at the beginning and if you think of the changes that we've seen since those days it really is exciting but what is also exciting are the changes to come so you were talking about brewing we can now make ingredients by fermentation and i keep saying it's the only way we can do new natural so using all those skills that you had as a brewer we can now change the substrate um, look at the organism closely we're using and we can now create materials which will do things that aren't nearly as good as some of the, the synthetics they, they offer us opportunities so they put in their own life so it's never been a better time to be working with natural and organic materials so uh, yep i think it's it's good and exciting and you are one of the um pathfinders <laughs> Thank you. And um, in terms of your career, what's one of the most exciting was meeting Anita Roddick, one of the most exciting and working with her, one of the most exciting moments of your life? Or? Yeah, I mean, it's strange, really, because, you know, we were talking about jobs and we talked about careers. But when you work with somebody as inspirational as Anita, you almost think it's like a religion. There's some personalities in the world that uh, when they walk in the room, everybody's aware of them. And Anita was definitely one of those very inspirational, very ahead of her time. Um, yeah, I was so pleased to work with them. One of my stories is I walked into her office and having been at Reading University in the food department, I'd been speaking a few months before with the farmer there and he showed me a crop of what was hemp. And he said to me, the sad thing is the European community, they will pay subsidies for farmers to plant hemp but there's no hemp industry, nobody makes rope, nobody makes canvas. So he said, it's just a shame it gets ploughed back into the soil and that's it. So I'm standing in Anita's office and she says, there's a farmer's written to the company saying, local chap, got some fields, what can he grow that we can use? So I was just larking about and I said, well, Anita, we could always grow hemp. And she said, tell me more. So she sent me off, go and find out about hemp. I, I honestly thought we would just be making t-shirts and and bags out of hemp but the more i read about the quality of the oil in hemp seed oil i realized that it's it, never do this but if you were to put your hand in something like ether and then take your hand away the oils that would remain in the ether the ones that are very easy to remove are not dissimilar to the oils in hemp oil so it's very obvious early on that hemp oil was going to be an excellent raw material in cosmetics. And that was the beginning <laughs> of the hemp range. And I'm so proud because I was looking on the internet last night and there's the picture of the new person who's at the body shop high up in some position, surrounded by hemp. And I'm thinking, that started in 1993, that idea. It's and lovely. here we are today, still paying their wages. So proud of that. It's so nice about how those those ideas evolved, really, and that, you know, and how they do. With, they sometimes you have ideas that gestate over generations within our industry as well, and they get better as it goes on, or more information comes through. I think that's very, very exciting. Um, another question would be: uh, Why do you think a career in cosmetic science is so good for young people? I think it's good because if you like science and you like the arts, this is the industry for you you'll get exposed to just about every aspect of science. So in developing a product, obviously you have to be a chemist, we have to make sure the products are stable and they're safe, so you have to be a microbiologist. So you have to be a jack of all trades and a master of all trades as well. You will meet so many exciting people. So if you are a generalist rather than someone who's very specific, you're gonna love our industry. If you're someone who's very specific, supposing you like microbiology, well, we are now so interested in the skin microbiome that the microbiologists are now more than the people to check the efficiency of preservatives. Now they're looking at the way our ingredients work. And we were talking about that fermentation. Well, if you look at the microbiome, you've got uh, millions of fermentations taking place between different organisms. So it's so complicated and difficult to describe. So now we need the mathematicians. So if you're a specialist in mathematics, we need your network analysis, 
your ability to use algorithms and understand big data so we can understand what the microbiome is doing. So there has never been a better time. So it could be uh, you're interested in augmented reality and how a computer image can show a product that's picked up by the hand becomes on the face or analyzing the complex data for the microbiome. So specialists, we need you. Generalists, we definitely need you. And creative people, this is your industry and it's on a human scale because you and I know you can work for the big global multinationals, but you could also be your own boss as you are. Now, there's no other discipline that offers you that opportunity. If you're a pharmacist, you're never going to own your own um, uh, Smith Glaxo Klein, are you? So this is an industry where we do things on a human scale for people. So I would say for young scientists, it wouldn't be a better place to start your career. Yes, yeah, so I always find uh, when we train people, we get a lot of people come and work at the factory and they start. And it's always um, it's astounding to me how many things they get experience in, whether it's, you know, doing the challenge tests, or whether it's uh, understand, uh, putting together the emulsions, whether it's getting the testing done, whether it's talking to the consumer trialing, because of course our industry touches everybody. So um, really it's a great place for people to, um, I think it's an excellent place for people to start their careers, but also to explore where the skills that they have can take them further. You know, and I've met a lot of um, a lot of people. You know, particularly in the um, perfumery, who who from the perfumery side, who have such wonderful imaginations about what to put together, etc. In terms of bringing a product alive, so I think it really is one of those industries that does really celebrate those uh, creative scientific minds together. Yeah, we're, we're we're a small industry too because everybody knows each other. If you look at the amount of money that we, we make each year, I mean, globally, we're a very valuable industry, but you soon find you, you meet people and it's friendly and you don't get overwhelmed. So I would say for someone setting out a career, the cosmetic industry is a great place to start. And when I fell into the cosmetic industry, it was a great place to stay because I could easily have gone back to academia and done all sorts of things. But uh, no, once I realised you could be paid for having fun, I decided I'd stay. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so it's one of those industries as well. I don't know if you're the same, but I certainly know um, still today and, and also for, throughout my entire career, it was one of those industries of, where I was sometimes I mean, I'm on, in the lab doing something, doing a development, you know, and before I know it, it's sort of 10 o'clock and then it's midnight. And you sort of can't stop because it's so compelling what you're doing. And I always laugh at how many, I mean, I think the one thing that every good cosmetic scientist needs is patience. Because sometimes when I look at the number of uh, prototypes that you have to build sometimes to get to where you want, it's quite, it's quite something else. You know, I think, oh my goodness, we're up to 150 on the prototype scale. Have you had that experience as well, Barbara? Yeah, and the satisfaction, though, when you do get it right. And as I say, if you think of the hemp range I've already mentioned, there it is still out in the marketplace, you know, decades later. So when you get it right, it's fantastic. It really is. Yes, and it's funny when products become cult favourites, don't they? You know, there's some from my previous roles that where they're absolute cult favourites with the um, wider public. It's always very interesting when you pick something up and you realise, oh, I remember how much uh, trouble that gave me to get these two ingredients together. Um, mm -hmm. You have been the president of the Cosmetic Scientists Society um, historically. Um, it's a great organisation. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that and your role there and why that's such a good a uh, place for people to start if they're in, interested in a career in cosmetic science. Thank you, Pauline. Yes, if they'd like to go to www.scs.org, you'll find the Society of Cosmetic Scientists webpage. Now, if you have a job, you have a job. But if you have a career, you really should join your professional body. So for career cosmetic scientists, the SCS is the place to be. And what we do is we, we offer you opportunities to meet fellow cosmetic scientists, so it's networking opportunities. We will look after your career. Very proud that we've just published this book, um, Discovering Cosmetic Science. This has been written for people who haven't necessarily got a scientific background, just want to know how these products are made. So 
if you're interested in the industry and not quite sure, then um, do pick up this book and uh, thumb through the pages. We do the uh, Cosmetic Science Diploma, which is a distance learning diploma. That's the professional qualification for anybody in our industry. So once you've got that diploma, employees know that you can walk straight into a lab and you can formulate and everything you've said about taking a product through from concept into the market, you know all that's needed to do that. So it's a course you can do in a year and you do it in your own home. And I'm very proud that we are just about to launch the uh, online cosmetic science course, which is it's an app that goes on your smartphone you can sit in the train or wherever you are and you can run through the course and it will teach you just the, just enough. You don't have to be a scientist, just enough to explain the science behind the products that we use. And when you've gone through the course, you get quiz questions as you go. And when you get to the end, if you answer all the quiz, quiz questions correctly, you get a digital diploma that you can put on your LinkedIn site to say the digital, digital certificate say that you completed the course. Fun to to do lots of cartoons and film videos in it to make it easy to learn and that's aimed at people who are perhaps in marketing journalists or perhaps uh, only got o-level chemistry and not sure whether they need to do the a-level and go on to join our industry so we're also part of the science council so as a member of the scs you can become a chartered scientist and we run courses we run lectures we also have a conference and we're extremely proud that this year we're going to be running the IFSCC. So that's the International Federation of Societies of Cosmetic Scientists. We're running their Congress in London, which, is, which means we'll have all the top scientists in London uh, for three days to discuss the most exciting things that's happening in science. And I, I've got the programme here. I mean, the sort of things we're going to talk about is the omics. So all these things you've heard about genomics, about how our DNA can, and epigenetics, how our DNA makes us, we're going to talk to people who are in those worlds. So next generation sequencing, that sort of thing. Neuroscientists, we've got top neuroscientists, are going to talk about how cosmetic fragrances and colour, how it engages our brains and our well-being. We've got uh, sessions on texture and fragrance. We've got uh, sessions on... Um, uh, all the cutting edges behind the different ingredients. But as Pauline will tell you, there are three sides to our industry. There's the ingredients, and there's the formulators who turn those ingredients into wonderful products, okay. and then there's the testing people who test and prove those wonderful products work. <laughs> three, three big areas. So there's careers in all those areas. So yes, what does a society do? It brings everybody together, and it gives network opportunity and we're your family in your career, and we'll look after your interests from a career point of view. Whereas when you're a company, it's the HR looks after your interests in the company, and of course your personal interests are looked after by your friends and family. So if you're in a career, join your professional body. I have to say, I think the cosmetic, I've been a member of the Cosmetic Scientist Society all my career. I think they're fabulous. They've been very, very helpful throughout all those junctions when I, you know, obtained the chartership, etc. Fabulous, really, really great um, organisation. So if you're a young scientist really looking for a bit of direction, it's a really great organisation to um, join. Uh, Barbara, I need to ask you, what's one of your favourite ingredients out there at the moment? One of my favourite ingredients at the moment? Oh, that's a curveball, isn't it? There's so many to choose from. Um, <laughs> If you could have a desert island, desert island, three, three ingredients to create a formula, what would you take? Oh, dear. Well, I've always talked about head oil, so I can't do that one again. <laughs> um, I don't know. I suppose the vitamins, because we talked earlier about vitamin C. Vitamin C is a wonderful, uh, wonderful material, but it's a problem to formulate with because it doesn't want to be vitamin C, it wants to be oxidized, and when it oxidizes, it changes color. So it's a challenge. So to produce a product with vitamin C in that is still efficacious and doesn't have a horrible color change. So I think vitamins are very interesting. I'm extremely interested in vitamin D3 at the moment, and we have to be careful in our industry because certain materials we're not allowed to use because they're technically drugs. But we also know, we think of skin as being that fabulous barrier that keeps all our organs inside and protects us from the outside environment. 
we tend to forget it also makes vitamin D3. And we've talked about the pandemic and COVID, how important vitamin D3 is turning out to be. And at this time of the year, all of us, we're talking now in the winter, and all of us are without enough vitamin D3. We don't get enough sun exposure. If you're in Spain, 20 minutes in the middle of the day on your face will give you enough sun. This is exponential, not linear. So in the winter in the UK, if you stood looking at the sun from the moment it appeared to the moment it disappeared, you still don't get enough vitamin D3. I believe, and I'm on my own here possibly, I think that we should be very sensible about the amount of vitamin D3 that we don't get when we use SPF to protect us from sun and replace it in some way. So when, you, when you're outside, you're protected from damaging UV, but within your lotion, you have precursors and you can do this with 7-dehydrocholesterol. That's the precursor of vitamin D3. Precursors that go into the skin and then let the skin turn that into vitamin D3. So that's one of the ingredients. So vitamin is very, very important. <laughs> and, and certainly when we look at um, new launches, vitamins are one of the things that most new brands talk about and put into their products. So I do think that's very interesting. Now, I'm, you sh I can do hours on this. I'm very keen on the microbiome. And I'm aware that the thing that we call postbiotics, so prebiotics is the inulin, the food that you use to feed the bugs. Bio pro probiotics are the bugs themselves, which is uh, a bit dodgy because we, we expect our cosmetics to last for three years. So in order to do that, to have a living organism in it, it's going to be a bit of a tall order. Either your product is going to go mouldy and smelly or your nice organism is going to die because you've made the product too hostile. So I think uh, you know, a probiotic is a difficult thing to do. But the postbiotic, we were talking about fermentation and beer. The postbiotic in beer making is the beer itself. So it's not the yeast, it's not the sugar, the malt, it's what's produced. It's the alcohol, it's the taste. So those postbiotics when they go onto your skin microbiome, they are actually the food in that food web that keeps your microbiome healthy. So very interested in vitamins, very interested in postbiotics. So they're, they're the two that I'm probably most excited about at the moment, but there's other things, there's color changing, <laughs> there's fragrances, there's temperature changing. How long have you got? <laughs> I, I think I share probably, uh, I certainly share vitamins, and we I tend to use vitamins a lot in our formulas. I'm, I'm a huge fan of hyaluronic acid, various different sizes. I think it's a great ingredient for the skin. And I also think actually, um, just a, like, uh, emollients like you know the hemp like argan like uh, rose hip etc are excellent on the skin um, and uh, like you I'm very interested in um, how much information is now coming through about how the microbiome can affect things like rosacea psoriasis the various aspects of uh, eczema etc I think um, the microbiome is it's a whole big uh, area to still be discovered in our world. So I look forward to what the next generation of scientists and, you know, uncover. Uh, you know, certain extracts that you and I know have been used for thousands of years. I mean, the Romans used them. And if we try and reduce them to that one active ingredient that does the job, we can't find it. And, it, and it's very worrying. But now, if you take that extract and see what happens when it meets the microbiome, you see, it's the changes in the microbiome. Either they'll create another material from it, or they themselves start triggering our immune system, or they start triggering our own body's defense system that makes a difference. So now we realize it, it, it is absolutely fascinating. And it, you know, it's all happening now. And the reason it's happening is, is the fact that we can do this next generation sequencing so quickly. So that's the technology that I think is so interesting. It took decades to actually decode the human genome they can now do it in hours and if you think of in the early days of photography we used to just take a single picture and then in the 1920s those pictures were like a flip book and we produced the first early movies so what we're, we're on the, the cusp now of going from those individual pictures that snapshot of your microbiome at a moment in time being able to put those snapshots together and use it like a flip book 
and create a movie where you can see how your skin is responding, how all those hundreds of different microbes are responding to the cosmetic, to the environment, to whatever you're doing. So it really is an exciting time. Yes, I also think in terms of um, understanding how the skin ages as well, I think we're on a really interesting, um, at an interesting um, um, junction because I think more and more information is coming out as to, you know, the overall antioxidant capacity of the body, how much, uh, how much the body can protect itself, what, what uh, molecules are involved in that protective mechanism. Um, you know, because I don't know if you've ever read any of um, Audrey de Grey's and the, you know, the, that concept that, you know, why she, the, the, how the ageing process works. But I find all of that and actually even just asking the question about, you know, how can we, how can we impact um, the way the skin ages is, is, is a really fascinating place and certainly fascinating for me when you start to develop a product and you're thinking, well, actually, what's the long term goal here? What are we trying to do to support the skin? But we do have this little problem because we make cosmetics we are not medical uh -huh. so we are we are making people polished colored decorated and generally look good and feel good but we're not supposed to make medical changes to skin but it, it is nice to know that this is possible yeah yes um, and uh, do you have any advice barbara for young women who want to start out in uh, science and particularly in cosmetic science well, this, my answer to this is going to surprise you a little bit. I was uh, invited to give the Anthena Swan Lecture and, at Hereford uh, University, or Hertfordshire University. And um, this is the network for women in academia. And I, to be honest, I had to look it up to find out what Anthea Swan meant. But in my research for putting the lecture together, I realised that the one thing that all girls, not just those in STEM, but especially in STEM, what you need to do is you need to go on a course for negotiating skills. Not languages, your science, your learning anyway as part of your STEM, but go on negotiating skills because when you think about it, when you start your career, you're on the first rung of a ladder. And unless you change ladders, change jobs, you will only increase your pay by the rungs you'll go up one step at a time so i became a lecturer at reading university i was so grateful for the job how could somebody who started off in secondary school be a lecturer and i never even questioned my salary until i was leaving the university and i realized that the young male academics who'd started at the same time as me were all much better paid than me and that was because we incrementally increased every year and because i'd started low i was always going to be lower so i'd say to anybody learn negotiating skills negotiate your salary <laughs> negotiate your well you're going to buy a house you're going to buy a car you're going you're to fall, ingredients. In love and fall out of love everything in your life comes down to your ability to negotiate <laughs> you're going to sell a product you're going to talk to customers you're going to do marketing you're an ingredient salesperson and you want to explain the science you're at the scs you're writing an online course those negotiating skills will be with you for the rest of your life and they'll be benefiting you. So I know that wasn't quite the answer you were expecting. No, I say to everyone, join that professional body, have a career, don't do a job, have a career. And uh, get those negotiating skills early. Pauline, you've got those negotiating skills because you've picked it up by osmosis as you've gone through life. But if you'd known that at the outset, I'm sure your wage packets as you worked for those big multinationals would have been slightly bigger right from the start. So definitely negotiating skills. I think negotiating skills are probably really useful across all industries, um, really, as a career, in terms of career. I also think um, probably for a, a lot of young women scientists, really, it's quite good to um, help uh, those negotiating skills and knowing that you've done a course like that can really help build confidence. And I think one of the things that I find with young people that um, come to train with us is that building your confidence you know sometimes you're stood in front of the bench and you're a little bit nervous about oh what if it goes wrong and actually the beauty of it is to build your confidence and actually i would have to say certainly for me as a formulator as a developer that nine out of ten times things uh, um, go wrong when i'm making an emulsion for example i wish i could negotiate with emulsions sometimes <laughs> but that's for sure. there's no doubt <laughs> 
definitely well worked together. That would be a nice thing to say. No, but I do, in all honesty, I think uh, negotiation skills are great for, you know, helping build that confidence. And I agree with you. I think that's a fabulous, um, you know, first base skill to have whatever your, um, you know, whatever your career choices. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add, particularly for women coming into the cosmetic science industry? Oh, well, cosmetic science in particular, um, it's, a, it's a great industry to be in. I mean, it, it's um, if you like using cosmetics and you want to understand more, right, you'll produce products. Uh, but like, you know, you're very proud of the products I know that you've had produced in the past, but you ought to understand your own skin better. So you'll make sure that you'll always look your best and your skin will always be at best and your hair will always be at its best. So I would say it is a good career for women to be in, especially if, if you care about your looks, etc. So um, I suppose you could argue the same for food science because nutritionally it would be good. So all STEM disciplines are good, but I just think our industry is a little bit special if you want to have fun, if you're creative, and if you love playing around with smelly things that feel nice, then we're the place to be, aren't we? <laughs> It's very true, except when I've except when I've combined the wrong things and it doesn't smell so nice. Those times. Well, talk, really talking good. of wrong things, when I was four years old, I I didn't realise it, but I was destined for this industry. Because one of my, my favourite games as a four year old was to go up into the bathroom, take all my mum's oh, expensive cosmetics, and mix them together in this game that I called Mucky Stuffs. Did I know that here I would be, umpteen decades later, creating mucky stuff? So, yes, if you like mixing potions and lotions, yes, with the industry, definitely. And I have to say, sometimes I was saying that um, the mucky stuff, when we're talking about, you know, I think with science, certainly as cosmetic science, one of the skills we talked about, negotiation skills, I think one of the skills I probably found the most, and I'm not sure whether I ever had it, but the industry has certainly taught me it or formulating has, and that's patience because obviously sometimes when you're creating a formula, sometimes I've got up to, you know, 150 prototypes before we're, we're close to where we want to go, or we've met the criteria, uh, particularly for us, um, you know, we work a lot with organic materials and uh, sometimes um, it's been, it's wonderful now because organic has moved on tremendously um, long since from when we met, um, but trying to make things work, trying to get that, um, that sensual and that odour and the feel on the skin right, that you need an enormous amount of patience for that. You know, do you find that? I do find it. I've got a silly saying that says, if it's easy, it's not worth doing. And it's usually <laughs> when, when you get up to that sort of, um, let's say the sort of 500th pilot and it's still not working, that's when you think, come on, if it was easy, I wouldn't get that great reward when it does work. So yes, it's it's part of life. But when you get it right, it's great. Yes, and and now, Barbara, you're working across our industry. Is that correct? With in terms of uh, you're more on the DNA and uh, tracing side. Is that? I, I am because everybody's talking now about transparency, and uh, it's all very well believing things but we're scientists we don't go around believing it's right and say we we think it's right and i have a gut feeling we do an experiment to check and we know so if somebody says my material i don't know it's shea butter and it comes from ghana how do they know so the first thing they say well i've got this piece of paper and it's a bit like that chinese whisper i think in america they call it the telephone game where you ask the person you got it from and they ask the person they got it from and they ask the person they were from. And, you know, you get to the beginning of this chain. And, and a lot of it, I'm sure you do the same as everybody else, in that you have a questionnaire that you send out just to make sure your supplier is not using child labour, is not having any malpractice, and that the material that's in your hands is what it should be. And, of course, nobody who does use child labour is going to tick that box to say, oh, yes, of course, we're using modern slavery in order to produce the product. So when it gets to your end and you've got this piece of paper document saying everything is good, how confident are you that it really is good? So what I'm interested in is a thing called blockchain. And blockchain is a way of securing digital documents. So instead of having one ledger which could be falsified, everybody in the blockchain has a copy. And if one is falsified, it tells all the other copies it's been a falsification. So that means that all those pieces of paper from my Chinese whisper telephone game, 
they are all correct and that nobody somewhere along the line has cheated. Now, the other thing we do, which is a DNA, which is really exciting, is we make specific, very short chains, only 200 nucleotides. We put them into the raw material and we put them at parts per trillion. Now, everybody who's had COVID or turned on the television in the last three years knows that PCR tests will pick up DNA at parts per trillion. We put tiny, tiny amounts into the starting material and you can follow it all the way through the supply chain. You can take a sample, do a PCR test anywhere along the supply chain. And now you know. So it's not, I believe this material is shea butter. Not only do you know it's shea butter that came from Ghana, but because DNA is code, you actually can say it was made on this particular day, even by this particular group of women. So what we're doing is what our industry is brilliant at, and that is taking technology from one industry mm -hmm. and applying it. So we're early adopters we adopt technology and we apply it to our problems so that's what i do as my day-to-day -day job so that's i'm a friend, very, friend of cosmic scientist <laughs> that's very exciting barbara that's wonderful it's really i mean i look forward to really what that can do for the industry further and as that becomes more and more i suppose the standard because obviously you know we work with um our standards and we do a lot of work to um, ensure that the traceability across our supply chain is there. But it's very, very exciting to, to know that that um, traceability, that proof, if you like, um, is 100% is proofed through this new technology that's going to come. That's fantastic. That's coming. It's great. And, and um, I'm guessing that you would choose suppliers that you trust and you know very well. You wouldn't use anybody that you were a little bit not sure about. Well, and I suspect some of your supply chain will be quite short. So that also means that you can be quite confident. But knowing there are these technologies out there, testing and uh, you know, available to prove people's claims is, is a wonderful thing. So the more, the more the industry uses it, the more we can be honest about traceability. Yes, that's, that's true. Yes, well, I mean, as you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit old now, so I've been in the industry for a long time. I've been in the industry for a while. So actually, um, you know, I, I feel really fortunate because I know some of the, you know, most wonderful growers in the world and the people that produce uh, materials. And obviously, you know, from some of the uh, people we connect to, we've been able to um, really uh, also get materials uh, the way we need them etc it's I've, I've been i'm always really surprised and really one of the things i really love about our industry is the have a go you know the the people who are prepared to you know slightly adjust a, a process or slightly try a new organic material etc it's really good the way i think um the supply chain in our industry tries to do new things i think it's fantastic and also human level, because the amount of material we need annually is, as I say, at a human level. Whereas when you look at the food industry, they're using thousands of tons of individual ingredients, where a ton of some ingredients can last us about six, seven years. So, yes, we, we use amounts which an organic farmer can grow for us realistically. We're not asking for huge amounts. Yes. Uh, and finally, I've got one final question. In fact, I've got two. I can't remember where we first met, Barbara, but I do know that you've been in my career, uh, my life, since my career started here in the UK. So uh, I can't remember where we first met. Was it an SDS conference? I owe oh, you. It might well have been. I, I was. It, it was after I came back from America. So I was lucky enough for about six years in the States, which I would recommend to everybody. It was a really good experience to work abroad. And I'm sure it was... When I came back to so around about uh, 2004, around about then, I think was when we met. So uh, a little while, yeah. <laughs> we probably haven't been able to, we haven't seen each other for a couple of oh. years now, so we'll have oh, to yeah, true. <laughs> get out and visit us again. And just one final question. Thank you, Barbara. First of all, thank you so much for sparing the time for today. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Tell us about uh, cosmetic science and, and your journey. Um, what is the biggest uh, challenge you've had to overcome as a scientist? Well, I've, I've got a lot of silly expressions, not just is it, if it's easy, it's not worth doing, but I, I also say that everybody should do one thing different every day. So every day I have challenges and I always feel good when I do the impossible. To be honest, my biggest challenge was I signed up for the London Marathon and uh, I'm not really an athlete. 
but I proud, I'm so proud I did it, and I did it in four and a half hours, which is not bad for someone who's not an athlete. So uh, that was probably, and I'm, I like to take on things, or oh, uh, where you're stepping out of your comfort zone, things that when you start, you're not sure whether you can do it. And so it, maybe I'm a bit overconfident. Yes, is there an but, example in your science career where you've overcome a big challenge either with a formula or... Oh, well, I can tell you, I remember I was a secondary modern kid, uh, lecturing was... Uh, I, one of my disappointments was I never thought I was a good lecturer. And it was only afterwards when I looked back, I realised that actually I wasn't a bad lecturer. I, I might have worked a bit harder at it. That said, I've enjoyed all my time in the cosmetic industry. So I, I wouldn't change things. Going to the States, that was a bit of a challenge. Um, but if you don't test yourself, then you don't know. And it's only when you test yourself and you succeed that you feel good about yourself. So uh, I like challenges. It's very hard to pick one challenge of all. Uh, your point about um, doing six or 700 different types before you finally get it right. Uh, I think we've all got examples of that. Tenacity. Don't give up. If you really want to do something, don't let people tell you you can't. I mean, again, remember, I left school without qualifications and I got a PhD. So if, people, if you want a PhD, just go and do it. Don't, don't listen to people who say no. This, one of Anita Roddick's uh, sayings was, don't give me the problems, give me the solution. So if somebody I, I, tells you you can't do it because, tell them, clear off, you go, you're going to do it. I think, I, think, um, I think doing a PhD has been really... Uh, great you know it's a great way to learn it's a great way to really focus your mind and I and I agree completely I think for anybody if you set your sights on something and you focus on it you can do just about anything you like in your life and uh, yeah. I think for any young scientist anyone who's thinking about doing science for example as a career I think have a go because it's great and you know I Sometimes when, you know, very, very early when I was in high school and I think I'm never going to understand this chemistry, it's too hard or this math. And actually you then sort of, with a little bit of time and patience and tenacity, you sort of get there and it's so nice to arrive that you understand the concept. Yeah, I'm totally with you there. Yeah. So Barbara, thank you very, very much for your time today. That was great. Thank you very, very much. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.